Today we're going to look at this idea of connecting the dots with the Bible in our lives and the, the impact that the Bible should have in our lives and how it should cause us to change. And so we're going to look at that this morning because there's, we can look out at churches all across this country and this world and see that the Bible does not play a central role in many professing Christians' lives. It's, they may read it occasionally, they may read it regularly, they can hear pastors teach about it, they can listen to a sermon and hear all about it, yet nothing changes in their life. There's a disconnect that is going on. And you might say, well, isn't reading the Bible good? Isn't hearing sermons good? Isn't listening to music that sing God's word? Isn't that stuff good? Yeah, it's awesome. That's amazing. The Bible tells us it's good to hear and to listen, but it can't stop there. Living for God is more than just hearing his word and reading his word. And I'll illustrate that. I, you know, years ago when I was a teenager, I can't remember now exactly how old I was. I can't remember if I was 14, 15, 16, or 17. They all blend together. But I know that I was a teenager at one point. And during that moment, I, I had a cousin of mine, Matt. He came and visited us. I think it was for just like a night or two days. I don't remember what it was. And he was supposed to fly out. Now, when he came, he came from his dad's house. And he came with like an amazing arsenal of fireworks. Like, these things were like they were the, we only got like those little fake ones you buy, the little tents. We never got the real big ones. He had the ones that shot bottle rockets, the big Roman candles. You could have wars shooting them at each other. Well, this day we started, you know what, we need to light off a lot of these fireworks because he's getting on a plane and people on the plane back then probably wouldn't like him to have fireworks that might go up pew pew in the plane that could be dangerous. So we decided that we were going to light off as many of these things as we can. So we're out there lighting the firecrackers, bam, 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 they're going all over the place and you know, you always take that one, uh, that one firecracker and throw it at the person that's getting ready to light it and scare them, you know, so we're doing all that stuff. Well, my dad comes out and says, all right, guys, it's six o'clock. You need to stop lighting fireworks. And we're like, okay, gotcha, dad. Cool, we'll stop. We're like, just stop for a minute. He goes inside. We wait like five minutes. And we're like, all right, go, pop, 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 pop. Well, the Grinch who stole Fourth of July comes back outside and says, no more of lighting fireworks. I already told you that. Get inside. So then we got stuck inside this house. And so we're like, man, dude, we're looking at his fireworks he has left, and he's got this really big one. You know, that professional grade one where you drop the ball, you light it, and that sucker goes boom. Psh. He had one of those left. And I'm like, guys, we can't let this go unlit. That thing needs to be lit. We have to do this. So we came up with a plan. At 3 a.m., we were going to wake up. Because my dad should be sleeping, you know, he could sleep through anything. So we decided 3 a.m., we're going to go to sleep now, we're going to set our alarms, we're going to get up, we're going to sneak out to this field that was in our neighborhood, and we're going to light this firework off. No one will ever know that it was us. So I told, we came up with a plan, all right, here's how we're going to do it. Me and Matt, we're going to go out there to the field, and we're going to light this thing. Then I told my brother, Kurt, I said, Kurt, your job is to stand at the window, of, uh, stand at the door, and there's a little window in our door, and he was to open it up and let us know as we came by if my dad was coming, because if he was coming, we needed to hurry quickly, sneak in, and go back in the room and be like, it wasn't us, it wasn't us at all. And so the plan was he needed to, do, to let us know, be the call-out guy, to be the eyes and ears for us. So we head out, we go to this field. I mean, it's, no one's moving. There's like not even the wind is moving. Animals are sleeping. And so we come out here, and we light the thing, and then we run away giggling. <laughs> we stand back, and then the thing goes out. The fuse doesn't light. You ever have that happen? And now you don't know if it's really lit or not. And so you're like, do I go check it? So I'm like, Matt, go check it. <laughs> and Matt says, no, you go check it. I'm like, no, you go check it. And we like argue, and it's fine, sissy. So I walk over, and I, you kind of look, because you don't want it to go boom, boom, and then knock your face off. So I look at it, and I'm like, it's not even lit, bro. So I light it back up. Now, as I'm running back, that thing goes Boom! The loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It was like a shotgun, a cannon, a bomb. This thing goes off. I look at my cousin Matt and we're like, we're so dead. We're in trouble. And so we turn running. Now this thing was so huge that it lit up the whole entire, we're like, it's like daylight out here. We're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We didn't even get to see the firework. Well, we run by the door and we're like, 
I don't hear anything. I don't hear. We go inside the house, slam the garage door, go inside the door that leads into the, the living room, and I walk in, I go, boom, and I run into something. I'm like, dude, Kurt, get out of the way. And I realize the thing's not moving. And so I'm like, where was my call-out guy? My brother had one job. Let us know when dad's coming to sneak back. And he failed. And so the whole moral of the story is there was consequences for him not carrying out his plan. But let me illustrate this, is that he had one thing. He heard the plan, right? The plan is let us know if dad is anywhere near you so we don't get in trouble. He didn't do that, and there were consequences. In the same way, God has given us a plan for our life, a plan to live for him, and if all we do is hear his plan, but don't ever put it into action, there's consequences for that. If you would, I want you to open your Bible to James chapter 1. And today we're going to look at what James has to say about connecting the Bible with our lives by putting action to our faith. Now, I know if you're like me and you're, you've been a Christian for a while, you've read the Bible, you come to James chapter 1, verse 22, and you're like, oh, I know this verse, I got it down, it's be doers of the word, I know all about that. And so I've had a tendency in my life, especially when I was in Bible college, to think I knew everything about every passage I've ever studied in my life. But what I had to realize, and what I still realize now, is that every passage that we come to can teach us every single time we turn to it. Because if we could remember it and live it out perfectly, God would have never gave us his word. He would have just left it. But we have his word before us. And so I want you to approach this saying, okay, God, teach me today from this passage. Even if you've read it a hundred times, you know, ask God, teach me what I need to hear this morning. It says this in verse 22. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you would, join with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that it has to change our lives, to change our attitudes, to change our actions. So God, we pray that as we open up your word and look into it, God, that you would challenge us, that you would change us, that you would transform us. God, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing, so God, we ask your Holy Spirit to move inside of us, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and feet that are eager to do your will. It's in your precious name we pray, amen. Before we go into this passage, I just want to give you a recap of James chapter 1. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the one that, they, uh, that everybody says is the one that wrote this epistle here, this short letter. And in there he says in the first, from verses 2 to 11, he, he tells us that we can have joy in all circumstances, all troubles, all trials. And says that we can have joy at all times in our life by asking God for wisdom. Then he goes on in verses 12 to 18 and says, okay, to live out this life of joy, you must have victory over temptations in your life. And so he gives us uh, practical applications to avoid and have victory over temptations in our life. Then we come to verses 19 through 21. And these are, he gives us three commands. He says three things. He says, you should be quick to listen. Listen to what? Listen to God's word. You should be slow to speak, and you should be slow to anger. In verse 21, he also says that you should treasure God's word that he has planted in your heart. And so we catch up here now to verses 22 to 25. He just said, be quick to listen. But then he gives us a quick admonition. He says that you must do what you hear. And James is writing to Christian brothers and sisters. He's not just writing to anybody. He's writing to Jewish Christians, people who said, I have faith in Jesus Christ. And when he looked at their life, he began to realize, man, you know what? This church is missing it. They're saying that they have faith in Christ, yet when I look at their life, I can't tell that they have faith in Jesus Christ. And so James is writing this to connect the dots for them that God's word should change how you live. And so in your notes, I put it this way. The first point I have is this. Connect what you hear with how 
you live. James 1.22, it says, but don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. All of us, God wants to move us from being hearers to doers. And when you see that word doer, you might even see this word be in different translations. If you have a different Bible, it says be doers of the word. And what the idea behind that is, you can't just arrive at being a doer just one day or just one moment. Okay, I read this verse, I'm doing that, I'm loving my neighbor, now I'm good, and tomorrow I'll live however I want to. That's not what it means. It means that this must be a daily thought process for you. It is a daily mindset that I am daily going to live out God's word in my life. I'm not going to do it just for a moment. I'm not going to do it just for an hour or just for three days and then the next 52 days I'll live however I want to. No, this must become a lifestyle. It must become something of habit that you do where it's a mindset saying, I don't want to be just a professing Christian. I want to be a practicing Christian. And it's going to take you realizing that you need to live out your faith. How many of you in here love lakes? Anybody out here love lakes? Man, we went to a, we were at a a house, we go on vacation to Georgia. And my my wife's grandparents, they rent a house. And this one house they stayed at for a couple years, it had a beautiful lake right in the backyard. You walk out to a dock, it's a beautiful lake. And what I loved in the morning time is because we go out there and it was a little cool, you'd sit out there by the lake and the water is just so still. It's like, you, there's no ripples. It's like, man, it looks like I could just walk on it, but, uh, but I don't, and it looks like it, and it's cool as it has like this steam that's coming off of it, the fog that sits on it, and it's beautiful. I also love lakes because I love to go skiing. I haven't skied in a long time, but I love skiing. I got to do that in North Carolina, and there's a lot of fun you can have in a lake, and it's a beautiful thing, but check this out. If a lake does not have any outlet for the water to flow, to go out, what happens to that water? Now, we can look at some of the canals as we drive around these streets here. Some of those canals, it's like I would not even put my toenail in that water. I am not gonna get it. It's green, it's funky, the water just gets still, it's stagnant, it's polluted, it's nasty, it's muddy, it's dirty. In the same way, if all we do is hear and never allow God's word to change us, check this, Our lives become muddy, dirty, stagnant, stale. So James is telling us, look, put your faith into action. I'm going to share a personal story about me because, you know, even some some simple things in our life, we can hear but not act with it. My wife, she dislikes, she'll tell you that she hates it when I give her a quick kiss on the chin. She hates it. Now, to me, I'm like, she would tell me that when we got married, like, hey, I hate it. I don't like it when you do that. Please stop doing that. And I'm like, what? okay, sure. Then the next day, I go and I kiss her on the chin. And she's like, man, I told, then I keep going back, kissing her on the chin because it's something I wanted to do. And so she was telling me her desire was for me to not to do that, but yet I wanted to do it and do it my way, and I continued to do it. Until one day, I came to my senses. That's not true, is it? I didn't come. She came to my senses and told me that I really need to stop that. But, you know, what it, what it opened my eyes to is that, man, you know, here she had a desire in her life for something she wanted and needed me to do for her. And because I wanted to be selfish and prideful, I wanted to do what I wanted to do and wasn't meeting her desires. And so I had to learn real quick, you know what, I'd rather meet her desires than try to meet my own selfish ones. And the same way God says, man, when I ask you to live a certain way for me, to live out your faith, we live it out because we want to meet God's desires for our life. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. Faith in action proves that we are right with God. Faith in action proves that we are right with God. Well, where do we get that from? Romans chapter 2. It'll be up here on the screen for you. And verse 13 says this, for merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. Merely listening to the Bible, merely listening to different things doesn't make you right. What makes us right then? It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Faith that lives it out, that allows God's word to change our life is the one that shows that you have been made right with God. Nowhere in here does it say, just listen to the Bible, listen to a sermon, listen to a CD, you are right with God. It says no. The only people who are made right with God are the ones that live out 
their faith. Verse 15 says this, they demonstrated that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. right. Many people get mistaken thinking, you know, I go to a lot of Bible studies. I read the word. I go to 52 Bible studies a week. I listen to 72 sermons a week. And you know what? I'm getting God's word in my heart. I'm getting God's word in my mind. And that's good enough for me. But the reality is God doesn't care how much you know about his word. He says, are you going to live out what you know? And there's a big difference. And I'm going to tell you personally, this is, a convicting chap- this is a convicting chapter because, you know, I don't have this lived out perfectly. I've had moments in my life where I've read it, I've looked at what God said, and then I've blindly done what I've wanted to do. And I didn't live it out. But God says here, man, if you want to make sure that you have faith that pleases God and that meets the desires he has for your life, it takes you living out what he says. Now this is the Apostle Paul talking, he's getting it straight from God, but let's go to Jesus, the highest authority that we have. Look at what he says in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, from the very words of Jesus. Blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into what? Practice. Jesus says, if you know the word, you know my teachings, then live it, then do it, put it into practice, prove that you are my disciples. You see, true faith in action makes us right with God and brings him glory. But here's the next thing. Faith in action makes us more like Jesus. You see, that's the aim of putting our faith in action. God wants us to put it in action. Why? So we can just follow a list of rules? No, he wants us to put it in action because as we live for him, we are made more and more like Jesus Christ. We are made into his image. He wants us to live like him. He wants us to be like him. And you might say, well, Brad, where do you get that from? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. So all of us who have had that veil, who is he talking to? All of us Christians who have had the veil, has had our eyes open to see who God is. Is. It says that as we move the veil, it can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him, which is who? Jesus, as we are changed into His glorious image. See, God has saved you not to stay like you were. He didn't save you to stay in your sin. He didn't save you to stay with all those addictions you struggle with, whether it's a, or maybe it's with relationships and sex and whatever it is. He doesn't want to save you to keep you in that. He wants to change you. He has an ultimate goal and a purpose, and that's to bring him glory by being like his son, Jesus Christ. And check this. He wants you to love as he has loved, unconditionally, Right? The Bible says that while we were still sinners, making bad choices, wanting nothing to do with God, that Christ died for us unconditionally. He wants us to love our enemies. He also wants us to forgive as he's forgiven us. He wants us, for every sin we've ever committed, for everything we've ever done in our life, he's forgiven. And he says, for us to forgive like Jesus. He tells us to show mercy as Jesus has shown us mercy. He tells us to give our whole life to God as Christ gave his life for us. He tells us to love God and love our neighbor like Jesus did. You see, God's desire for us is to put our faith into action so we can truly live like Jesus lived and experience all the blessings that come with that as we're made more and more into the image of his son. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. I wrote it down this way, and this is, a challenging one for myself as well because you know this is the danger of not putting your faith into action faith that takes no action is fake faith i'm going to say that again it's important faith that takes no action is fake faith where do i get that from James 1.22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. If we claim to have faith and don't live it, we are lying 
to ourself that we truly have faith. James takes it a step further. He says in James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, and I know for all the note takers out there, I made a typo. It's not chapter 4, it's chapter 2. So you could correct that. Don't look for chapter 4. You might go crazy finding 19 and 20 because it's not there. But it's chapter 2. But James says this. You know, if he says, look, if you're not living for God and you're not living out your faith, it is a fake faith. You don't truly have faith because it's more than just believing. In verse 19 it says, you say you have faith. For you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is what? Useless. He says if you have professed faith, but you don't live it out, and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, good job, you have demon faith. And if we know about demons, do they live for God? Surely not. What do they live for? Themselves, their own agenda. And there's many Christians that think, well, I believe Jesus died, he rose again, and he came back, you know, he's going to come back again, and so I'm good, I'm right, I can live however I want to. No, you can't. It's not real faith. Real faith is believing about Jesus Christ, but it's also about living out your faith for him. Because to not do that, is fake faith. And in James chapter 2, 17, we won't look there, but he even goes as further saying that your faith is dead. In other words, faith without action, your faith's a corpse. Try to get a corpse to do anything other than just lay still. Does it do anything? No, can't get it to do anything. And James says, look, if you have faith but don't live it out, your faith is dead. Because when you come to Christ, And I know in my life, when I gave my life to Christ, I did not remain the same because my heart was affected. It was changed. Now, was I perfect? Am I perfect? No, absolutely not. But I could not remain the same because of the work that Jesus did in my life that he pushed me and he moved me to live for him. And so for people to say, I believe in Jesus, yet I don't want to live for him, your heart has not been changed. Because if it was changed, you would live for him. And so my challenge is, man, don't have fake faith. (laughs) Bible says, work out your salvation. Make sure you're in the faith because none of us should want to have to be in this place that we have fake faith. Connect what you hear with how you live so you can grow into all that God desires for you to be. Here's the second thing I put in your notes from this passage. Connect what you see with what you change. Connect what you see with what you change. What do I mean by that? Verses 23 through 24, we'll have it up on the screen, says this. For if you listen to the word, the Bible, and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. James uses the perfect analogy of a mirror. Okay, we've all seen mirrors before. We all, I'm sure, how many of you used a mirror today? Anybody use a mirror today? Okay, point out somebody who didn't use a mirror. You can tell. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Uh, but we all use a mirror, and it's a great thing because when we look into a mirror, we can see a true reflection. Now, I know every morning I go, I get ready, I look in the mirror, and I make sure that, you know, my eyebrows are okay. I got to make sure my hair is looking fine because I don't want it to be all over the place, right? And so I look at my beard, make sure, and we look for things that are, are defects or imperfections, whether it's a pimple, whether it's, you know, whatever we have on our face, and we see these things that need to change, and then we change it, right? Because we don't want our hair to look like a hot mess. We don't want our clothes to be, uh, to be buttoned improperly. You ever have that time you have the shirt that is unbuttoned weird and it's like one's in the wrong hole and it looks weird? Like if you just do that, people go, why is your shirt like that? Is that a new trend? Is that cool? And it's like, actually, no, it's not cool. I just didn't look in the mirror. And so we lo- use mirrors to find these imperfections and then we change it. We respond accordingly. And what James says here is, look, God's word is a mirror for our life. How's that? Well, when you look into God's word, it shows us who we really are. 
right? It shows the good things about us. It shows that, man, if you're a Christian, you have a new identity in Christ. You're a new creation. You're a new creature, that you have all the blessings that God gives you to live for him. But it also shows us who we really are when it comes to sin in our life that needs to get removed. And James says when you see those things, whether it's pornography, whether it's, you know, adultery, whether it's bad relationships, sex outside of marriage, whatever those things are, it says that those things need to change. And when he points this out, he kind of does this as an absurdity. And I want you to think about this. James is basically saying this. Who looks in a mirror, looks at their face, sees a pimple, a booger, whatever it is, who does not fix that? When they see it, who would let that sit there and go, oh, I see all these things, I'm just going to leave it. He's saying, look, nobody does that. When they see that imperfection, they fix it, they get rid of it. He goes, so if we're willing to fix our physical bodies, and it would be absurd for somebody not to fix their hair or whatever it is, he said, then how more important is it for us? How can we look into God's word, see what needs to be changed, and then walk away unchanged? And this is why, he said, because it's absurd because when we look into God's word, it's not just something that some man wrote thousands of years ago. These are the very words of God. How can you walk away and stay unchanged with the very words of God? And he says, it's absurd for someone to do that. Yet how many of us have done that? And so James puts it here because it's a reminder, it's a challenge for all of us. We all have the natural tendency to be lazy when it comes to changing the spiritual things in our life that need to change. And so he points it out saying, look, change these things. Here's the next thing in your notes. God's word reveals our true nature. Shows us who we really are. In 2 Timothy chapter three, it says this, all scripture is inspired by God. And it is useful for what? To teach us what is true. To make us realize what is wrong in our lives. You ever read a passage of scripture and gone, oh man, that's happening to me right now. You ever have that moment? That's God saying, okay, I need you to change that. I need you to, to give that to me. Goes on, it says, it corrects us when we are wrong. The Bible does that to me all the time. It teaches us to do what is right. Verse 17 says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God has good works in store for you to do. But it takes us allowing God's word to correct us. It's allowing God's word to rebuke us. It's allowing God's word to teach us. Hebrews 4.12 says this. It even goes further with God's word. Not only does it reveal who we are, but also says this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So whatever hidden things we may not even know about yet, God's word reveals those to us. His word is alive. It is powerful. It is a mirror to our lives. Now here's the danger. Next thing you know says this. If we don't change, we are in sin. Where do we get that from? Just a few chapters over in James chapter four. James says this. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So the danger for all of us, man, if we're professing faith in Christ and we don't make these changes that we see and that God points out to us, we're living in sin. Now, as a Christian and you have true faith in Christ, we have those moments where we allow this sin to, to trap us and to bind us. And does that mean that God has, has lost his love for us? Does that mean that God has kicked us and thrown us away and is going to forget? No, that's not what it means. But it hinders your relationship with God. And God is saying, look, as long as you keep that sin in your life, I, I cannot give you all the blessings I have for you. I cannot have that right relationship with you because that sin is going to keep you from me. And so what do we do if we're in that place? You confess your sin. First John 1, 9, confess your sins. And God is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. If you want to truly be set free from sin in your life, allow God's word to penetrate 
and change your heart. Now, I know what you're thinking. Brad, there is so much that I had to change in my life. There is so much that we have to do. I can't do it. Well, I agree with you because I can't do it either. You're right. You can't do it. I want you to check this out, what Jesus says in John 15, 5. When it comes to you living out for him, when it comes to you getting rid of the sin that's in your life, this is what Jesus says. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And so the tendency, I want you to catch this, the tendency is not, okay, let me put out a list of rules and write down everything I'm not going to do today. No, that's not what it is. It's as you focus on your relationship with Jesus Christ, as you develop that, as you spend time with Christ through his word, through prayer, through chasing after what he wants you to do, he will begin to help you change as you rely on his strength and his spirit which he's given to every christian that is what is going to allow you to get victory over these sins that strangle you entangle you whatever it might be binds you and chain you it's only through your relationship with jesus christ that any of this can be done in your life and so it's not as much of oh i got to put all my effort no it's relying on jesus to change you that makes the change in your life in this last verse in James chapter, in James chapter 1, verse 25, James tells us the why we should live out our faith. But then he gives us the practical application of how we live it out. Third thing I put in your notes is this. Connect the perfect law with your freedom. James 1, 25 says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. He combines two ideas. He says the perfect law and your freedom. Now, we can get hung up and say, well, wait a minute, we're Christians, we're under grace, we're no longer under the law, how can living out the law really cause me freedom because this law has rules, it has things that we're supposed to do, how is that freedom if we're going to be bound to the laws, right? Well, the law is still fulfilling its purpose in our life, the law is still valid, Jesus has this to say in Matthew 5, 17, he says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish, get rid of, do away with the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And so the law is still valid. It's still good for us. But if you look at Jesus' life, what, how, how is the law still good? How can we combine this idea of law and grace? Look at how Jesus lived his life. He actually lived out the law. You see, he took the heart of the law, what its ultimate goal and purpose was. The ultimate goal was to give God glory, but the other goal was to love your neighbor as yourself. And that to live it out means we're going to live the law out with its true heart and its true intentions, its compassion, its mercy, its love, its grace. And if you look at the Pharisees that were living during this time, the Pharisees only worried about their outward appearance. And Jesus even called them out. If you remember the story in the Bible, they're like, Jesus tells the Pharisees, look, you guys worry so much about the outward appearance, but yet on the inside, you stink. You are filthy. You are polluted. Because what the Jewish people made it about was just obeying these rules. They didn't have the relationship with God that gives you what you need to live out your faith. Hebrews 18 states it this way. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. What's the purpose of the law, the Bible, that we have before us? The purpose of that is for us to know God. 
That's what the law does. It pushes us to know God. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people. The purpose of this law, this Bible, this book is to push you and move you forward in your relationship with God. And as you do that, you will begin to grow and begin to live out your faith boldly without being afraid and be able to have victory over sin in your life. So the law is good and it relates to our freedom because as we know God, we know that there is freedom in Christ, that Christ truly sets us free now here's what happens though when he says look into the perfect law he says look carefully in our english translation we might be like okay look carefully that's cool but the real idea behind that is when you look at look carefully it's stoop down now i don't know if you how many ever as a kid or maybe you're an adult i do this sometimes if i see i'm walking and i see something move you know i might look down now if it's something that i don't know what it is we all What in the world is that? And then it's like, ew, that's a bug, that's gross. Now that's me doing that, I don't like bugs. You might be like, oh cool, that's a bug and you eat it. But I look at it, but the idea is you stoop down and you're looking at it carefully. This is the admonition that James gives us when we're looking into God's perfect law, when we're looking into his word, the Bible, that we look, stoop down, and carefully observe and learn from what God wants us to do. But our tendency in our day is, I have have three examples of how we look in God's word, how some of us can look into God's word and it not be a true stooping down, taking care and looking carefully. The first one, I call it this, the drive-by readings, right? You pick up your Bible, you read it, and it's like, all right, cool, I did chapter one. You walk away, two minutes later, you have no idea what you just read. That's not looking carefully into God's word. That's a drive-by. You ever done a drive-by? I've done drive-bys in my life. Then I have what I like to call the onesies, okay? The onesies are this. You read one verse, that's it, one verse, but then you don't think about it anymore the rest of the day or the rest, the next hour, the next five minutes. You read one verse, you walk away, and it has not changed your life one bit. Then I have this third one. It's what I call the crammers, These are the ones where you ever had that moment where you got behind in your devotions and it's like a progressive reading the Bible and so you got behind a couple days and it's like you need to read 64 chapters today. And you're like, ah. And so you read 64 chapters, you walk away and it's like nothing changed your life. Nothing happened. Because you see, when we read God's word, we meditate on it. We say, God, how do you want me to change What needs to change me? Where do I need to trust you more? And when we truly learn from God's word, we think about it carefully. We must look at God's word carefully. Then we must allow it to change us. Here's the next thing I have in your notes. The perfect law is God's word in our hearts. James 1.21 says this, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. God has put his word inside of our hearts. And that's the cool thing about what we experience as Christian is God's word is written on our hearts. And I, my favorite verse in the Bible is Psalm chapter 37, four, because it says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, what does that mean? I'll illustrate it with a personal story. When I first became a Christian, okay, I had a horrible mouth. Every other word out of my mouth was a curse word. And so I remember I started going to church, started reading my Bible. I was reading through the book of Isaiah, 160-something chapters in that book. But as I began to trust God, to read his word and to pray. I remember I was at work one day and I was talking to the people there. They're like, "Uh, I don't know how we got on it, but I told them, yeah, I'm going to church now. And they're like, what? You going to church? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm like bleep, 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 you know, saying these bad words. And I went away to go get something out of the cooler and God just kind of spoke to me and said, if you're telling people you're going to church, you probably don't want to be saying all these bad words. Now that's a desire that I never had in my life before. It's a desire that I just was saying words that I wanted to say and that came to my mouth and I just said them. But as I got closer to God, God put this desire in my heart that motivated me to say, you know what, God, you're right. 
I'm going to need your help with that because those are the, that's my vocabulary is those words. And so I need to create some new vocabulary. And so as I began to grow closer in my walk with God, God put these desires in my heart. Notice that verse does not mean God's going to give me my desires. No, it's as I grow in my relationship with Christ, his desires get put into my heart and those desires become my desires and I begin to live out those desires and that's what brings change the disconnect happens when all we do is hear and we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and some of us in our Christian lives we get disconnected because we leave out the part of growing in our relationship we don't spend time with Christ we don't spend time in his word praying to him and then we wonder why our lives are dirty and are a mess because you're not allowing God's desires to become your desires I love what Jeremiah 31, 33, 34 says. It says, but this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel in that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. Why? For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. The word of God in your heart allows you to know God. Bible's not a rule book. Bible's not something that just, oh, it's hard. No, this is how you know God. This is how you build your relationship with God. This is how you grow in him. Allow him to change you. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. I said it this way. Obeying the perfect law truly sets us free we saw in James 1 125 that says the perfect law that sets you free but John 8 31 32 we've all seen this verse before most of us should have it says this you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free what's his truth his truth is his teachings where do we find Christ's teachings where do we find God's teachings it's in your bible that we have so readily available to all of us, whether it's in book form, whether it's on our phones, our apps. For us in America, we don't have an excuse to not know God and to not grow. We have Bibles in all different colors, right? Tie-dye, whatever you want. You could get it however you like. There's no excuse for us. And as we go into God's word and hold to them, he truly sets us free to live. And you might say, well, Brad, how, how is obeying rules freedom? Well, I want you to picture the roads that we drive on, 595 or I-95. Imagine if there were no laws on the roads. Now, I-95 is already dangerous. There's some people that drive like that, like they don't have any rules. But imagine if there were no rules and everybody could drive however they want to. All those scary teenagers that are driving now, imagine if they could drive parents however they wanted to. Well, I'm gonna show you a, vid a little video clip that I found the other day on YouTube. I want you to check out, this is what it would look like if we just had no laws on the road. Imagine if that's how roads really were. And that, it's actually a woman driver who, I'm not sure what she was, 
Why? I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> That's not, shame on you. That's not what I meant. I was just saying it was a woman. I was just qualifying who was driving, not with the, whatever. Uh, but that lady, like, she drove crazy. And I don't know what she was thinking even when she stopped to get out and walk. I don't know what she was thinking there. But she's like, and I'm sure she's wondering, I don't know why I got arrested. It's like, lady, your driving is ratchet. That's why you got arrested. Like, you can't just drive however you want to. And there's, like, you have no laws. I mean, the world would be crazy. But, you know, if people really did drive like that, they, they run the risk of accidents and bodily harm and death and all that kind of stuff, and they can hurt themselves or hurt others around them. Well, here's the, here's the analogy and how we can relate to that spiritually in our life, is that if we feel that there is no laws to be governed by, and we begin to live life on our own and not by what God's word says, then we can cause harm to ourselves and we can cause destruction to ourselves and to those that are around us. And so it's so important. It's not that you know, God's word keeps us from having fun, that keeps us from living for him. No, actually, it preserves us. It keeps us because, you know, me personally, I had a period of time where, you know, I was drinking alcohol and I got addicted to it. And I remember saying, man, what in the world is going on? Like, and I had to give it to God. Now, I don't look back and say, God, you told me to quit drinking that was such a struggle for me. That was, I can't believe that you're not gonna allow me to be addicted to something in my life. I can't believe you're gonna keep me from jail. I can't believe you're gonna allow me to have healthy relationships and have you know, faithful, you know, faithful relationships to you and whoever else. God, no, no, no. You see, when God set me free from addiction to alcohol and to cigarettes and from you know, pornography in my life, I was set free because I was no longer bound to that. So when God came in and said, look, I don't want you to do that, he was doing it for my benefit so I could experience the blessings he had and not have to feel trapped and burdened by addiction. So when God said, look, I'm setting you free from that, it's not, oh, I gotta obey. It's no, thank you for saving me. Thank you for breaking those chains in my life. Thank you for giving me the freedom I never had. God doesn't tell us these things to keep us from having fun. It's actually the opposite. Those of us that have had Jesus Christ set us free and change our life know that there is true freedom in living under God's protection and living under God's will. Romans 8.2 says this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. As you obey his law, he sets you free from the law of sin. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what sin traps you, keeps you down. But it's only by your obedience to God through his word. And he says, you will be set free. It sets you free from the law of sin. And the enemy wants you to, to, to hold on to the fact, oh, I'm always gonna deal with this. God can't set me free. And so we don't go to God. We don't try and, no. There's a promise. Jesus can set you free from sin your sins. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. I said it this way. God blesses those who allow the living word to change their life. The end of verse 25 says this. For, uh, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. What's those blessings that he give us? Does that mean that once I start living for God, he's gonna give me health, wealth, and happiness? No. God never promised you as a Christian you were always going to smile in your life that everything was gonna be like a fairy tale and live happily ever after. So what blessings does God give us? Ephesians 1, 3 says that God, all praise to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. He's given us every spiritual blessing to live for him. Not some, not a few, every spiritual blessing blessing. God doesn't call us to do something he's not willing to help us do. So as you strive to live for him, he's given you every spiritual blessing you need. Beyond that, I want you to check out what Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says. Oh, the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Oh, the joys. Or stand around with sinners. Or join in with the mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. And then what happens? They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Life has storms, do they not? Yeah. 
Life has its struggles. Life has its ups and downs. But those that hold to God's word and live for him, it says, oh, the joys that they have. Because see, what happens during storms is as if you're a tree, and that's what he relates us to as a tree, if there's storms, you begin to blow, you begin to turn sideways and forwards and backwards. But it says that here that you will stay, you will bear fruit each season, you will not be run down, you will not be beaten, you will not be downtrodden, that there is joy. It doesn't mean you're going to be happy all the time. What it means is that there is joy because you are trusting an all-powerful, almighty, all-loving God, and you will prosper and have joy as you obey and live out God's word. Here's the fourth thing I put in your notes. Connect with God, connect with God's word through personal study. 2 Timothy 2:15 gives us a challenge. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. At the bottom of your notes, what I want to do just real quickly I want to give you, because some of us in here, we might say, you know what, I read God's word, and I just really don't know what to do with it once I read it. I don't really know how can I get more out of my reading of God's word so that it can have the opportunity to penetrate and it can change my life. How do I dig in a little deeper than just reading it and going, okay, now what? How does this work? I'm just going to give you five practical questions to ask about any passage of scripture that will give you more insight, that will give you more clarity to what you're reading and what God would have you to change. The first one is this, what does the passage say about God? Second one is this, and it's in your notes, what does the passage say about us? Third, are there any promises in the passage? Fourth, does the passage ask us to do anything? And lastly, does anything in the passage grab your attention, grab my attention? I'm going to put a verse here on the screen, verse uh, James 1, 5. And I'm just going to give you a practical illustration of what this looks like to go through a passage, a verse, and apply these questions and come out with something that we can take away with. James 1, 5 says this. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. What does the passage say about God? God is generous, Right? Generous with what? Generous with giving. We have a God who is willing to give to us. He's generous. He's approachable because it says if you need wisdom, ask God. And here's the other thing. He will not be angry because you asked. He said he won't rebuke you because you're asking. What does it say about us as people? We need wisdom. It says if you need wisdom, which implies that at some point in time you will need wisdom for your situation. That we all as humans need God. We're dependent upon him. Are there any promises in this passage in James chapter 1 verse 5? Yeah. God gives wisdom when we ask. That's a promise. So the next time you need wisdom in your life, who do you ask? God. And he will give it to you. Here's the fourth thing. Does the passage ask us to do anything? Yeah, it asked us to ask God, right? So now I know if I need wisdom, that I need to ask my generous God who will give it to me and promises to give me the wisdom that I need. Okay, you catching that? And then here's the last thing. Does anything in the passage grab your attention? I wrote it down this way. God is always ready to help me. All I have to do is ask him. He is always faithful to me no matter what. And I guarantee you, as you go through those questions, it's going to give a better understanding to God's word and will help you walk away with something instead of just reading it and not knowing what to do with it. If you would, this time I'd ask you to bow your head and join with me in prayer. Living for God is not something that is easy. It is hard because each of us are affected by sin. But we have a God that desires to have a relationship with us. And that relationship means that he needs us to change how we live. And so I'm just going to give a moment for all of us because I'm not perfect. This passage challenged me greatly this whole entire week I've been studying it. Because I see that there's areas of my life that I said, man, I've been kind of just doing what I wanted with that. And so I've had to give those areas to God and say, God, you know what? I want to put my faith into action. 
And I want to give you guys a moment of prayer just on your own because I can't make this happen for you. It has to be a real conversation that you have with God saying, God, these areas of my life, I've been living my way. I need you to help me. I want to live for you. Will you help me?